Whoever you lead us in prayer. Okay. Holy Father in heaven, we're so thankful for another Lord's Day that we're able to come here and worship you, Heavenly Father. We thank thee for all the blessings you so richly bestow upon us each week. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that we always stay in your word. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. I guess y'all heard about the shooting <laughs> at the garlic. Oh. The garlic festival in California. Oh. Then you heard about the shooting at Walmart in El Paso. Yep. Then you heard about a shooting at a bar in Dayton, Ohio Last this night. morning. Sometimes yeah. 1 o'clock this morning. Um, I read, I was read <coughs> part of an article put out by Breibart News uh, that included the manifesto of the El Paso shooter. Anybody else see that? And that's what I was just thumbing through my phone to see if I could locate it again. I wanted to read part of his manifesto, um, and I didn't read the whole thing. I don't know how long it is, but but he he said the guy that did the shooting said that he does not trust our government, Democrats or Republicans, either one. He went on to say uh, that way back when the Native American should have. Uh, fought back against the white man when the white man came in and that's neither here nor there for what I want to say this morning but the short part that I read of his manifesto tells me one thing about that man I can't tell you his name uh, and that is that he had his faith in what man in man mm -hmm. and specifically he had his faith in our government um, should we have faith in in man mm -hmm. To some extent, but we can't put everything in that bucket. You know? Can't put everything in, in there. Uh, we should have faith in one another. What are some of the things that we should have faith in? What are some of the things we should not have faith in? Well, our, our future really is in God's hands. We can't always depend on the government to make it work just for us. And that, that's the ultimate there, having our, having our faith no. in, in God, uh, letting Him take care of the things He takes care of. Uh, and through certain stories in Scripture, we learn that there are things that we can take care of. There are things that we can't take care of. When Jesus raised the little girl from the dead, <clears throat> what did He tell the parents immediately? She was always sleeping. Is that what you well, the, she, well, he told her that before he raised her. But after he raised her, what was the first thing he told the parents? He said, get that girl something to eat. Yeah. Now, if he can raise her from the dead, can't he just snap his fingers and make her unhungry? So why would he tell her parents, get her something to eat? Well, that's something they can do. That's something they can do. They didn't have the power to raise her from the dead, but he did. Um... I want you to turn your attention to Hebrews 11 this morning. And we're going to spend our entire time in this chapter. Uh, and maybe for the next uh, three weeks. Um, and we're, we're basically going to take this verse by verse. <coughs> faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. All right, a lot of people have said that verse 1 is a definition of faith. And a lot of scholars would disagree with that. They say it's not a definition of faith, but rather it is a description of faith. And the word faith uh, in chapter 11 is mentioned, or it is referred to, uh, we'll say it referred to as it or by which. It's mentioned or referred to in chapter 11 at least... 29 times 29 times the reason this is called the hall of faith or the chapter of faith and there's so many people mentioned in here that uh, exemplified faith all in different ways but uh, their faith was in the same being their faith was in the uh, the creator of the universe um by faith, there it is again, we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. All right, two things in there. Number one, 
how did God make the world and the universe and everything therein? How did he make that? He spoke it into being. He spoke it into being. I mean, he spoke it and it happened. It kind of reminds me of uh, when Jesus came walking on the sea and what was the, uh, the atti- not the attitude, but what was the feelings of the disciples in the boat? They thought it was a ghost. But what else were they concerned with as far as the storm goes? It, it, it was bad. It was bad. So when when Jesus stepped into the boat, um, he said three words. What was it? Peace be still. Peace be still. And what happened, Vernon? It was. The storm just... I can't tell you how many times I've been out. I love going fishing on a river over in Scottsboro. Get out there at 6, 7 o'clock in the morning, water looks like a piece of glass. And then as the sun rises up and water and you start doing this, and, and I tried it. I tried it a hundred times, Vernon. Peace, be still. It don't work for me. It does not work for me at all. Jesus spoke the storm into calmness, and God spoke the entire universe into existence. And it, that's that's one of those things that I have trouble wrapping my mind around. The other thing about verse 2, that last phrase, things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Have you ever stopped to, to think about that? Sometimes you see a phrase in Scripture and it'll reach out and grab you. The things that we see were made by things which can't be seen. That doesn't make sense. Susan, you ever bake a cake? What do you put in your favorite cake? Flour, sugar, cake mix. <laughs> cake, <laughs> cake mix. <laughs> she wasn't going to say that. <laughs> but you can see all those things. Have you ever put an invisible ingredient in there? No. You know what my wife would say? Yeah. She'd say, I got an invisible love, ingredient. Love that's the invisible <laughs> ingredient that's got to go into it. Um, things which are seen were made by things which are were not made by things which are visible. That points to the very definition of create. Genesis 1 1 in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. <coughs> what's, what's so fascinating about that word create? Well, he, took, he took nothing and made something. He what? He took nothing and made something. That's exactly it. That's the whole idea behind the word create, to make something out of nothing. Shelby, what have you ever been able to create? Nothing. A mess, maybe. That's the only thing I come up with. We can create a mess, we can create chaos, because we make something out of nothing in in that sense. But these chairs, these chairs were not created. This floor was not created. If, If you can see it, and man made it, it wasn't created. John, sometimes people, you know, strive to work through science and their own logic, how something could happen, and they discredit God a little bit in the process. You know, I, I saw a program on TV <coughs> this week. I was intrigued by it. Something about uh, secrets of the Bible or something. Mm-hmm. It's a little, little guy on there, and he was over investigating how Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, how it went under the way it did and trying to figure out what would cause that, you know, exactly, you know. So um, he investigates <coughs> and all the salt down there and then they talk about all the gases and stuff that was below there and so uh, he moves an area they still doing digs and he finds that uh, this is likely where the city was, very likely because of where it was uh, laid out and and they talk about a big volcanic thing that would come up there. And if it came up, it would have been like so many nuclear blasts and it would cause, you know, uh, different things to happen that, you know, uh, would have maybe presented this uh, fire to come come up out of the ground, you know, and consume these people. They're always trying to explain train. away the supernatural. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't we check that box? From above. 
how did that lot slide turn into a salt or fill up salt? Yeah. <laughs> Can they explain that? Yeah, good question. And the same thing went on to talk about the uh, children of Israel escaping Egypt, you know, and got down into this area that they think they've identified, and uh, this blast over here called a tsunami coming through about that time, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anything that they can dream so, uh, of. So, you know, again, there's. No, no faith in what the Bible says on face so, value. Now, 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 now scripture <laughs> does give a scientific explanation for the water parting for Israel to pass. They said a strong east wind blew yeah. all night long. I don't, what fascinates me about that, if the wind blew hard enough to part the water, then why didn't it blow all the people away too? Yeah. You know, um, but you, know, you, you can you can prove a lot of things where the Bible's right about scientific things, but to take things out, sort of uh, make a yeah. recipe over here how it could <clears throat> happen and, and leave the Lord out of it, then they got a problem. There. Over and over and over and over again, people, scientists, archaeologists have found things that do nothing but I don't want to say support the Bible because the yeah. Bible doesn't need any support. Uh, the Dead Sea Reaffirms, Scrolls, yeah. yeah, the Dead Sea Scrolls found in 1947, uh, a great big wooden ship was found in the mountains of Turkey at Mount Ararat several years ago. Uh, what you were talking about, Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, science, scientists have found little pellets of brimstone scattered everywhere. They can't explain that. Um, the the where, where Israel crossed the Red Sea, you know, I think it was two or three, four years ago. They found uh, remnants of chariots and wheels and human bones at the bottom of the sea. And over and over again they find it and they want to explain it away, si explain all of it away scientifically. I mean, over there at Sodom and Gomorrah, is there a volcano over there? You can say something, Preston? Hey, well, it could be, but you know, still you, you don't have to remove God from it. There's, there's one of the, you know, God is in the middle of whatever happens. Right. However, he made it happen. Right. right. He's <clears throat> in control. He, that, that's the key word. He's in control. He may not cause something to happen, but you have to say that at least he allows something to happen. Because if, if it's outside of him causing it or him allowing it, then he's not in complete control. So he either causes it or he allows it, just like with Job. He didn't cause Job to suffer the way he did, but he allowed Job to suffer the way he did. We, we weren't there to see it happen, but we have evidence of the fact that it did happen. You know, and, yeah. uh, that leads us back, surely, to believe that the account was accurate. You know? Exactly, exactly. All right, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more, sacrifice, a more ex excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which, there's one of those references to faith, uh, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, <laughs> God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead still speaks. All right. Now, <clears throat> in that account in Genesis chapter 4, there's no inkling, no indication at all to the faith of Abel or the faith of Cain. I, I haven't found it there. The only way I know that there's a difference in Cain and Abel's faith is right here in uh, Hebrews chapter 11. There, there's nothing in chapter 4 of Genesis that mentions Abel's faith. Um, <clears throat> but we, we know this. The Hebrew writer says it was Abel's faith that made his sacrifice acceptable to God. So if it was Abel's faith that made it acceptable, then... What was it about Cain's sacrifice that made it unacceptable? Probably didn't do what God told him to do. That's probably part of it. Maybe he didn't really have faith in God. He needed there, his there was some up. faith missing there. <clears throat> and, and, you know, that this is such a profound point in verse 4. I really wish one of the writers in Scripture had elaborated... <coughs> on what Cain and Abel did. <coughs> but they didn't. Now also, <coughs> sometimes you, know, you think about what he brought uh, may have been more representative of what, look, what he could do, you know, rather than what God was doing for him. Maybe, you know, it's just a possibility. True. 
All right, also, there's verse 4. God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he, he being dead, that Abel still being dead, still speaks. How does Abel still speak? Historical account. The historical account, that's one way. There's another way. And James Kaufman uh, included in his commentary on Genesis a whole section dedicated to this thought right here. From Genesis chapter 4 and verse 10, <coughs> God told Cain, the voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Um, that... That's a frightening statement to me. I mean, it's one of those things that I can't wrap my mind around. I can't comprehend how does Abel's voice cry out from the ground. The voice of his blood, rather. <clears throat> All right, verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him for before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. All right, uh, the account of Enoch, <clears throat> Genesis 5, 21 through 24. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah, and after he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Um, that's all we know of Enoch. And there, there's uh, that and what the writer mentions here in Hebrews 11. Uh Who are the three men that didn't die? Well, really two men that didn't die. Elijah. Elijah. And Enoch. And we can say Jesus, but he died, but he come back to life, and then he resurrected the dead. Uh, so Elijah and Enoch. Another one of those things I can't wrap my mind around. How can you not die and still go to heaven? But they did. Um, without faith, it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and he is a reward of those who diligently seek him that uh, what is the opposite of faith don't say lack of faith unbelief. say what unbelief unbelief that's one one way to say it look for another five letter word that has a letter in it that doesn't belong Doubt. Doubt, yeah. Doubt. What letter doesn't belong? B. 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 Why is B in doubt? I don't know. I doubt it should be there. Uh, and somebody asked me, how do you spell doubt? D-O-U-B-T. No, really, how do you spell doubt? They didn't believe me. Um, he who comes to God must believe that he is. That's a reference to doubt. Why is it Why is it that without faith it is impossible to please him? Well, the, the simple answer is if your life is absent of faith, then it is full of doubt. So it's impossible to please God if your life is full of doubt. Uh, by faith, verse 7, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. All right. <clears throat> what had Noah not seen? Rain. Rain. Now, Carrie, I have read, not in scripture, but in commentaries, what have you, that up to this point, it had never rained on the earth. I don't know that to be true. That's an intriguing thought. 
I know it hadn't rained in the Garden of Eden while Adam and Eve were there because the ground was uh, wet from moisture coming up from the ground. I know that, but we're talking about some 1,550 <coughs> years from Adam and Eve to the time of the flood. Um, if, if that's true, that it has never rained before, that makes the story of the flood all more fascinating. That makes the uh, story of Noah's faith even more intriguing because the, the writer says Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen it, it wasn't just Noah who's never seen rain uh, but everybody nobody on earth has seen rain as, as far as we know um, if Noah's never seen rain is it possible for him to comprehend the idea of the entire world being covered with water? I mean, go back and look at Genesis chapter 6 for just a moment. verse 13 and God said to Noah the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence through them and behold I will destroy them with the earth make yourself an ark of gopher wood make rooms in it da 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 uh, drop on down to verse 17 and behold I myself am bringing flood waters on the earth to destroy uh, from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life everything that is on the <laughs> earth shall die if, if my name is Noah and I'm standing there listening to what God says right there, you know what I'm going to do? i got to raise my hand and say, wait a minute, Lord, what's the flood water? What's rain? If, what, what's rain? Yeah. What, what is flood? You're going to destroy the earth and, and everything in it. How? Please explain this to me a little more. Uh, that's what I picture myself doing. Uh, but Noah... Like the Hebrew writer says, he's divinely warned of these things not yet seen. He's mo he moved. He's he is moved with godly fear. All right, and it's the the combination of that faith and godly fear that causes him to obey and build this great big boat that's going to house everything that needs to live uh, through the flood. Um. You, you mentioned that TV show a few minutes ago, what, uh, Secrets of the Bible? Yeah. A lot of people, or, or a lot of movies, a lot of uh, documentaries come out on Scripture, and I detest TV shows and movies about Bible because they're always wrong. All right? They're always wrong, period. It drives me nuts. But every once in a while, I catch myself watching one, and even though it drives me nuts, the whole concept of it does because it's always wrong. There are some truths in there, some things that can come to light. Did, did you see that movie? Uh, oh, Steve Carroll, where he built an ark. Evan Almighty. What is it? Evan Almighty. Yeah, Evan Almighty. Did you see that one? And, and uh, Morgan Freeman played the part of God. You know, it totally stupid movie, but <laughs> but it's funny. And the, the part that got my attention while, he, while he's building this ark, he doesn't want to build it, all right? He doesn't want to build it, but he finds himself growing long hair and a long uh, Robertson-style beard. <coughs> yeah. uh, and, you know, he can shave, and by the time he goes to the breakfast table, it's already back down here, and his clothes change instantly to look like Noah. But the, the thing that, that got my attention about that movie is that people treated him about building an ark the same way people treated Noah building his ark? I mean, he. God, he's crazy. It, it's crazy. funny that you know he didn't have a building permit. He didn't have anybody from OSHA present. He didn't have any kind of <laughs> inspections done. He was building in a place that wasn't. It was a residential area. You know, getting in trouble with all these governmental agencies. But the part that made the stupid, the movie so stupid, 
is in totally out of whack with scripture is at the end of the movie where the where does the big ship land on land why didn't everybody just run to higher land you know that that's not what Noah went through that's not what he went through at all um, and the, these floodwaters that God brings on the earth that Noah's not yet seen nobody else has seen yet um, and this this is I didn't read this anywhere. I come up with this by myself. Um, so I may be wrong. But you think about it. How long did it rain on the earth? 40 days, 40 days 40 and 49. Days. All right. Scripture says the entire earth was covered <coughs> with water. What does the entire earth mean? Mountains and all. Mountains and all. All right. You know, you see where I'm going with this, don't you? How high is the Mount Everest? <laughs> that 29,000 feet, five or six miles above sea level. So, if it rained 40 days and 40 nights, and the earth was entirely covered with water, and Mount Everest is 29,000 feet, and I can't remember the figure I come up with, um, but the water had to accumulate at the rate of and I'm working on a 20 year old memory right now. It seemed like about 40 feet per minute, 30 to 40 feet per minute. And what just rain the. Uh, yeah, the spring the water, come, the, water come forth from the deep, you're right. Yeah, wow. It did. But the water accumulated, it started rising at the rate of 30 <coughs> to 40 feet per minute. I mean, you've got like two seconds to decide how you're going to die. <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's it. Uh, and, and Noah obeyed. All right, there's another phrase in there. Uh, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world. Now, if you notice that the, what is that, prep, H-E is a preposition, right? What, what is it? No, that's a noun. Pronoun. Pronoun. Okay, yeah, pronoun. Uh, I don't know why I said preposition. Ignore that. Um, he is not capitalized. So it's not God condemned the world. That's Noah condemned the world. How did Noah condemn the world? He built the ark. By what? He built the ark. Okay. Um, in 2 Peter 2 and verse 5, bottom line, Noah condemned the world through his preaching of righteousness. Uh, 2 Peter 2 and verse 5 and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood, flood on the world and on the ungodly. Um, Noah, somewhere between 80 and 120 years, it took him to build the ark. His entire time was not spent just building the ark. What else did he do? He was preaching the whole time. He was preaching the whole time. And Carrie, this is one of those things that <coughs> is encouraging to preachers sometimes. But when Peter preached the first sermon, how many people responded positively? 3,000. 3,000. Noah preached for a, a century, and how many re people responded? Zero. Zero. Nobody. Nobody that changed their mind. Um, all right. But Noah condemn the world in his preaching of righteousness. All right, here we go to Abraham, verse 8. Uh, Abraham and Sarah, 8 through, eight through uh, 12. By faith, <clears throat> Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of heirs with him of the same promise, for he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as a and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars 
of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. <clears throat> Vernon, you ever take a trip and not know where you're going? No. Presley, you ever take a trip and not... No, you just retired. <laughs> so, so you can you can take a trip and not know where you're going. I guess. But I've always wanted to do that. To take a trip and drive. You know that? Not sort of not far distance, but back roads. I mean, I, go. If 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 money were not a problem, that's what I, I would take off and just drive and come back. I don't know, six weeks or six months or six years from now, just drive. Uh, there are a lot of people who live in their RVs, and that's what they do. They drive from one uh, park, one campground to another, spend a, a month or so. Like, I'd love to do that. Um, but that would be of my own choice. That'd be what I want to do. <coughs> when Noah woke up that morning, or I mean when Abraham woke up that morning, he had no intention of going on a trip much less going on a trip and not returning. But God told him to leave, and so why did Abraham leave? He had faith in God. Because of his faith in God. Because of his faith in God. Uh, that second sentence of verse 8, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Not knowing where he was going. Um, he dwelt in a foreign country, but the writer describes that as the land of promise. He dwelt in tents with Isaac and Jacob. Um, he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. What city are we talking about there? Heaven. It could be heaven. It could also be, think about it, is it Jerusalem? It's builder and maker of God, but, but the application for us definitely is, is heaven. Uh, faith, or Sarah herself also received strength to conceive. See, how old is Sarah when she becomes with child? She's way past the childbearing years. And when she's told, hey, Sarah, you're going to have a baby, how did she react? How did she react? She laughed. She laughed. And, and, then, and, and then she was questioned, why did you laugh and what did she, how did she respond? I didn't laugh. Oh, yes, you did. Oh, yes, you did. Um, but still, the, the stress, uh, the point is made about her faith because she judged him faithful who had promised. And who promised that? God. No, God. All right. <clears throat> Therefore, from one man, verse 12, and him as good as dead. I like the way the writer put that. I mean, how old is Abraham when Isaac comes along? 100? The promise was made at age 95, I think, right? Yeah. And, it, and Isaac didn't show up till 10 years later. And Ishmael showed up before then because Abraham took things into his own hand. Um, but the Hebrew writer says, Abraham is as good as dead. What does that mean? He's not dead. He's got a lot of traveling to do. He's got a lot of child rearing to do. This is probably the strongest statement the, the Hebrew writer could come up with saying, Abraham too old to have babies. He's way too old. Him as good as dead. But with Abraham's faith and God's promise, then Abraham's descendants are numbered as what? Sand. Stars in the sky and a sand on the seashore. You know, I, I never used to really understand that, that phrase about the stars in the sky because uh, you look up at the sky at night on a clear night and you can see, I've been told, you can see about 2,500 stars or galaxies or lights or, or whatever. 
about 20, that's not a lot. You could hold 2,500 grains of sand in a teaspoon. You think about the number of grains of sand on the seashore, and that's comparable to the number of stars in the sky. So how many stars can we not see? Right. That's mind blowing, totally. And Abraham had the faith in the being who created all of this. And here's the beauty of, of that thought alone, <coughs> is that you and I have faith in that same being. Verse 13, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now, um, scroll, scroll on back up to verse 3. What, what could Abel have possibly known about the promises of God? We don't know what conversation went on between him and God, what God promised him about anything. But somehow, some way, Abel had faith in God. What about Enoch? We don't know what kind of conversations Enoch had with God, or God had with Enoch. But we know that his faith was to the point that he didn't die. God just took him. And then he dropped down to Noah. Why in the world would Noah be, uh, have, re what would be Noah's reason for building this great big boat that nobody can understand what it's for? It boils down to his faith in God. Um, Abraham and Sarah, their obedience to leave their homeland, not knowing where they're going because of their faith in God. None of these, as they said, as the writer said in verse 13, none of these received the promises. They all died in faith. They had faith in God, but none of them received the promises that God told them, told them about. But they saw the promises afar off. The, or, or they didn't see them, but they knew they knew they were coming. They knew they were coming. Verse 14, For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he had prepared a city for them. One of the themes of Hebrew, if you'll read all every verse of, of, of Hebrews you'll find one common word through it, or you'll find several common words through it, but one of those words that really sticks out is better. Better covenant, better uh, city, better country, better home, better future. You'll find better, 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 better all throughout Hebrews. And the idea is compared what was in the Old Testament with that covenant with the new covenant. And what had been promised to us. I mean, did did Jeremiah really know about what Jesus was going to do? Did Isaiah know about what Jesus was going to do? Isaiah wrote about it, but did he really comprehend what was going to happen? Uh, Peter alludes to this idea. Um, I can't remember how he said it. Things that angels desire to look into. Um, I wish I could remember the, pa the passage. Uh, things that angels <coughs> desire to look into. Those were the things that the prophets wrote about that they didn't fully understand. They wrote about all this stuff about this better covenant and, and better country and better future, better, better uh, eternity, uh, but they didn't fully understand it. it. All these promises were afar off. John, they had uh, one thing here I kind of throw back to last week a little bit as a tie-in, but their their heart was such that they wanted to do what God wanted to do. Now, last week we looked at Jesus talking to Nicodemus and talked about being born again of the water and the Spirit, and we discussed that some, how the people's heart, you know, was committed to do what God mm -hmm. wanted to do. That's why we submit to baptism, you know, it's a seemingly insignificant thing and there's no salvation in the water as such but it's because God commanded it so it's a combination of the heart 
willing to yield uh, maybe what we think is logical or not logical or whatever, you know, do it because it got will. A lot of this applies to these people where they were doing things because they had a heart to go with Jesus, go with God, you know, what he's commanding here rather than uh, all the facts and uh, all the uh, knowledge of what would happen in mm -hmm. advance. Not, not being able to clearly see the future or predict the outcome accurately, and yet we still do it. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened with all these that, that, that we just, uh, just read about here. Um, all right, let's see if we can get through verse 22 since we're still talking about Noah. I, I mean, Abraham. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. Concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he, he also received him in a figurative sense. <coughs> Alright, stop there. <coughs> Abraham's already exemplified his faith in a tremendous way in leaving his homeland not knowing where he was going. But this takes his faith to an even deeper level. I mean, what this this in our culture this day and time right now, if you were to offer or start to offer your child as a sacrifice, guess what would happen to you? By Preston, we'll see you no more. You going to jail or you going to you going somewhere? We'll never see you again. That's not going to happen. Uh, or that that's what would happen today. But Abraham obediently took his son. Uh, to wherever it was, built an altar, had servants with him and told the servants, y'all stay here. And then what did he say? He said, me and the lads going over there. And then what? And we'll be back in a little bit. Who Who is we? Abraham and Isaac. So Abraham, <clears throat> I've always wondered, you know, did Abraham really think that God was going to let him kill his son for sacrifice? Well, the Hebrew writer says right here that Abraham believed that <clears throat> God was able to raise him up. Abraham knew that. You know, he he got the altar made, he's got Isaac bound and on the altar, and he's got his knife right here ready to come down. And what happened? God spoke to him and told him. God spoke to him through an angel and said, Don't you hurt that boy. Do no harm to the lad. <clears throat> and so Abraham was able to keep the promise he made to his servant, said, We'll be back in a little while. And when they built the altar, and Isaac was just a young kid, what did he ask Abraham? Where's the sacrifice? Where's, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham's response was, God the Lord will provide. Uh, it, it's almost as if Abraham wasn't worried about anything. I mean, uh, to, to think about your own child dying, take that way farther. Think about taking the life of your own child. My, my daughter totaled her little truck uh, about three weeks ago. 2007 Tacoma, she drove it seven and a half years. Plain Jane, four cylinder, five speed manual windows. She moved over to Decatur her third day back to work, or, or moved over to Athens her third day back to work. She rear ended it. Bam. She never calls me unless she wants something. 6 06 a.m. on Wednesday morning, my phone rings. I says, I said, Oh no. And I learned a long time ago, I don't listen to the words when somebody calls me. First thing I listen to is the tone of voice. Yeah. That's the first thing I listen to. And, uh, hello, Daddy? Yeah. I'm okay. Well, I'm thankful for that. She said, but. I said, oh, no. I've been in an accident. I don't know. So, anyway, that's a scary thought. All right. We'll pick up there at uh, about verse uh, 20 <coughs> next week, Lord willing.
Oh, right. Good job. Thanks, sir. Thanks, sir. <laughs> All right. I even marked it down so I won't get lost. <clears throat>